In this video, we're going to be making the classic game Tic-Tac-Toe using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Let's give the game a quick try. As you hover your mouse over the board, you'll get a preview of where you're going to be placing your X or your O. When you click inside a box, you get a nice click sound. If you get three in a row, we have a red line to strike it through and play some game over music. So let's go ahead and do that by getting X to win over here. As you could hear, we got that game over music and we got that red strike through over here. We also have text at the bottom of the game over here telling us that the winner is X and we have a play again button. Clicking play again resets the board and restarts the game. This is Coding with Adam and let's get to the code. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, like, and share. For this project, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code and we have Chrome open on the right. We're starting with a blank folder that we have open over here and we're going to go ahead and add our index.html and we'll also add our index.js. In our index.html, we'll add our boilerplate HTML. We'll do that by hitting exclamation and then hitting tab. Then we get our boilerplate HTML over here and what we'll do is we'll rename document to tic-tac-toe. Inside our body, we'll go ahead and just add our script tag, which will link to our index.js. Well, let's go ahead and add one more file to our project. So the other file that we're going to add is going to be for our styles. So we'll add an index.css and then back in our index.html, we'll just go ahead and link that and we'll add a link tag with an href, which goes back to our index.css. And you need an REL tag of style sheet. And we'll save that. Next, we'll go into our body and we're just going to add an h1. And for that h1, we're just going to write tic tac toe. To run the application, I recommend using Live Server. And the easiest way to use Live Server is to go ahead and open up our extensions inside Visual Studio Code, search for Live Server, find Live Server, and install it. With Live Server installed, all we have to do is go back to our File Explorer over here, right click on index.html and click open with live server. The great thing about live server is that it has hot reloading. This means that anytime I save one of my files, it'll automatically be refreshed in my browser. For example, let's go ahead and modify this title, save it, and now we just have tick on the screen. If I go ahead and undo that and click save, then we get the title we had before. The approach that we're going to take with tic-tac-toe is first we're going to build the UI and then we're going to build the functionality in JavaScript. Well, let's start by building our tic-tac-toe board. As you know, the board is three across and three down. Each one of these little squares is considered to be a tile. There are many ways you can build the tic-tac-toe board. You could use a table. You could use CSS flexible box layout. What we're gonna opt for is CSS grid layout. Let's go ahead and start to build our board. On our HTML over here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and create a div. And we're going to give that div an ID of board. Inside of our board, we're going to go ahead and add our tiles. Now, each tile is going to have a few attributes. One of those attributes will be the data index. The data index is going to be a number. Eventually, when we start using this board, we're going to want to know what each tile is. So we're going to identify it with a number. Then we're also going to have a class. The class for each one of these pieces is going to be called tile. So we can use this for styling and identifying all the tiles in our HTML. Then just for this part over here, we're going to add a one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create nine of these tiles. And for each and every single one of these over here, we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just kind of number them. So we'll just number all of these. So we've got three, we got four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So there we go, we have each one of our tile pieces. Inside each div, you can see that we added a number. And since we added that number, it gets printed out on the screen. And since each div is a block element, that means it takes up the full width of the page. And that's why we see them stacked one on top of another. Now we're gonna use the grid so we can arrange these tic-tac-toe tiles in a grid like this. So over here will be number one, two, three, and then nine will be over here at the bottom. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll switch back to our HTML over here. We'll go to our index.css. Now it's important to remember that the ID of this div over here is board. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and find that board like that. And then we're going to add display. We're going to do display grid. Now we're going to go ahead and use something called grid templating. We're going to set a template over here. Now what I'm doing is I'm saying that there's three columns and each column is 100 pixels each. 
When I save that, we're going to get three different columns over here. We're kind of almost there just by setting our columns. Then what I can do is I can add some spacing for our rows and we can say our rows are also 100 pixels. Let's go ahead and change that to rows. Now we have something that looks more like our tic-tac-toe board. Let's also add a cursor. So what we can do is we can add cursor, make it a pointer. So now when our mouse hovers over our board, it's a little pointer. Before we continue, let's go ahead and just align our all our items so that they're centered. You can see over here we have the tic-tac-toe centered on the screen and we have the tic-tac-toe board centered. But let's simply do that by using our body tag over here. And inside our body tag, we're going to use display flex. Now by default, flex is going to go ahead and display everything in a row. So we need to change the direction. We're going to say our flex direction is not going to be row, but it's going to be column. Then the last thing we'll do is we'll align our items center so that everything is centered on the screen. To match our application, we're also going to go ahead and set the background color. So we'll set the background color to black and everything will disappear for a little bit. Then what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and we'll modify our H1 and we'll set the color over here to green yellow. And on our tiles, which we haven't introduced yet, but we're going to use the class selector. Now, if you remember, all our tiles have a class of tile. Then we'll go back over here and we'll set that color to also be green yellow. Now you can see our tiles look a little bit off. So let's do something very temporary right here. I'm just going to set a margin. So this part is temporary, the margin 10 pixels and the background color that we're going to set. I'm going to set that to gray. Let's update our font size as well. So it's easier to read. We'll set that to 2EM. By adding this gray background and this margin of 10 pixels, we can see that our number is being written in the top left corner. What we want is for the number to be in the center of the tile. In order to achieve this, what we can do is we go ahead and use flex again. We'll use display, we'll mark it as flex. Then we'll use justify content and we'll put center, which will put the number centered on the horizontal. And then on the vertical, we'll use align items, center, save that. And now our numbers are in the center of the squares. Then we can go ahead and delete the background color gray and the margin 10 pixels as that was just temporary. The next thing that we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to draw our borders for our tic-tac-toe board. The way that we're going to be doing this is we're going to be using the borders of our div. So this is one div over here and we're going to have a bottom border and a right border. And then in this one, we'll just have a bottom and a right. And then in this one, all we need is a bottom border. Let's go ahead and implement this. In order to achieve this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to add two classes that we're going to be using. One is going to be called right border, and we're going to have the following property. We'll just have a border right. And for the size of this, we're going to make this 0.2 EM, and we're going to use solid, and we're going to use the color indigo. And then we can just copy this one over here, and we're going to make a bottom border. So we'll just rename this to bottom, and then this one to border bottom. Now let's go back to our index.html. And over here, we're going to be applying these classes to our different tiles. Also switch back to that tab over here so we can see what we're doing. For the first one, we're going to have a right border. So let's do a right border and save that. And you can see that line and we'll do a bottom border. We'll save that. And you can see our grid is starting to be built out. For the next one, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We'll have our bottom and right border. And then for the number three over there, all we need is our bottom border. Save it. We'll go down to the next row. So number four over here. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Bottom, right and bottom border. And then right and bottom border. You can see it being built out. It looks kind of cool. And then this one, once again, it's following a pattern. So you can see it goes right bottom, right bottom, bottom. And then this will be similar as well, except we don't need the bottom over there. We just need the right and then the right. And there you go. We built the tic-tac-toe board. It's kind of neat. All we had to use was our bottom and right borders. And now we have this tic-tac-toe looking board. Next, we're going to work on the strike through. So for the strike through, in order to properly do that, what we're going to do is we're going to change all of these numbers over here to just X's. And there's a quick way, little way you can do that. I'm just going to highlight this and this. As you can see, it's highlighting all of these. Then I'm hitting Command D, and this is Control D on Windows. And you can see it just keeps adding cursors. 
Then once we're done adding those cursors, I can go ahead, select the numbers and replace that with an X. To exit multi-cursor, just hit escape and you'll go back to having one cursor. Let's start by adding the HTML that we need for our strike through. So the strike through is going to exist inside of our board. So since it exists inside our board, after the last X we have over here, data index nine, go ahead and add a div and we're gonna give it an identifier of strike and we're gonna give it a class of strike as well. Then we'll go to our index.css and I'm gonna add this below our bottom border over here. I'm gonna add our strike and for our strike what I'm going to do is I'm going to set its position to absolute and I'm going to set a background color to dark red. Next what we're going to do is we're going to be creating individual classes to represent the different strikes that we have. For example there can be a strike on the first row, the second, and the third and then we can also have vertical strikes as well on our screen for these three columns that we have. As well, we also have a diagonal and a diagonal. Let's start by implementing our first strike on the first row. So let's do the following. We're going to have a strike dash row dash one. So this would represent the first row. And then for that, we're going to set a width of 100%. And we're going to set a height of four pixels for our strike. And we're going to set a top of 15 percent. Now we don't see anything just yet. So we have to go back to our index.html and we're going to modify our strike over here and we're going to use our strike dash row dash one and we'll save that. Now that doesn't look quite right. I was expecting that our line would be contained within our board. Well let's take a look at our index.css. Our strike row one over here has a top of 15 percent what if we change this number over here to zero? I would expect it to be over here. We'll change that to zero. And it's not, it's at the top of the screen. So since we marked our strike over here with the position of absolute, it's actually absolute to the entire body, not to our board. To make it absolute to our board, we have to go to our board and modify its positioning. Well, let's take a look at that property. If we look at our position over here, the default value is called static. So with static, it's going to the top of the page and it's ignoring the fact that we want our board to be the parent of our strike through. If we change this value over here to relative and save it, now we get our line over here at the top. Let's go ahead and scroll back down to our strike row one over here and we'll change that to 15%. And we can see it's going through all of our X's. By marking our board as relative, now anything that's absolute within it will stay within our board. Let's go ahead and implement the strike through for rows two and three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna copy this one over here, paste it, and I'm gonna change the top percent because that's the only part that's changing over here. And I'm gonna change that to 48%. And I'll change this to a two. Go ahead and copy that and paste it. And then we're going to change that to a three. And our top percent will change to 83%. Now these numbers I didn't figure out just by looking at the board. I played around with these numbers in order to figure out what was the best position for our strike throughs in order to go through the X's. The last thing that we'll do with these over here is we're going to go ahead and test them. So we'll go to our index.html. We'll change that one over there to a two to confirm that that strike through goes through. And we'll change this over here to a three to confirm that goes through the third row. Next, we'll go ahead and implement the strike through for the columns. What I'm going to do is I'll just copy what we have over there and I'm going to rename the row to column. And what's going to change over here is instead of the width being 100%, we're going to have a height of 100%. So we'll change our height over here to 100%. And then our width is going to become four pixels, just like we had for our height over here. And then our top, or this one over here, instead of top, it's going to be left. And our left is going to be set to 15%. And we'll change this over here to a one as well. So let's start by testing that first column we have. And we'll change that to one, save it, and that looks perfect. We can then go ahead and implement our two other columns. So I'll go ahead and just copy this one over here. We'll just paste that twice. I'm going to have two and 
three, and then 48% over here, and 83% over here. I'm going to save that, then we can go ahead and test it. So we'll put a two over here, and we can see it goes to the second column, perfect. And we'll go to the third one, save it, and also perfect. Let's go ahead and build our diagonal strike throughs. Let's start with that first one. So diagonal one over here. So for this one over here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that right away. And I'm going to go over here and add that. Then we'll go back to our index.css and we'll kind of just build this out piece by piece. So if we do width 90% over here, and we're going to do a height of four pixels. So we kind of have a line over there, as you can see. We're going to do a top of 50%. So you can see this thing kind of moving around on the screen. It's not going to make too much sense right now because this doesn't look like it's doing anything. But the magic is over here when we do something called a transform. In our transform, we're going to do skew our Y. We're going to be changing our Y position of our line and we're going to change it by 45 degrees. Now trust me, this took a lot of playing around with. These are the numbers that I came up with at the end of the day that helped me kind of build this line out so that it looked like it was going through all of our different tiles. We can then go implement our other diagonal, so diagonal two. And this one's gonna be really simple. All we're gonna do is change our transform. So we'll name that number two, and it's just gonna be negative. 45 degrees. So let's go back to our index.html, make sure that works, change that to a two, and you can see that we have our other diagonal. Next, we're going to go ahead and do the UI for the game over screen. So this is the screen that we're going to build over here. It's got the text that lets us know who the winner is, and we have the play again button. We're going to go ahead and add the game over area below our board. So below our board, we'll go ahead and add a div, and we'll give it an identifier, and we're going to call that game over area. Inside our game over area, we're going to go ahead and add an H2. So that's going to serve as our title, letting us know who the winner is. And we'll give that an identifier of game over text. And we'll just put in some temporary text over here just so we can see what it looks like. And we'll say winner is X. And then below that, let's go ahead and add our play again button. Our play again button will give it an identifier of play again. And for the text, we'll go ahead and just set that to play again. Well, let's go ahead and style our game over area. I'm going to copy the game over area identifier and go into our index.css. And we'll go ahead and add an ID selector for that. And for these styles over here, we're just going to do text align center. I mean, you won't see anything aligning just yet as that text is the color black at the moment. But we'll finish setting up our game over area. We're going to add a border. We'll give that a color of indigo, eight pixels, and make it solid. We'll just add some padding of 50 pixels. And we're going to make that width equal to 50%. And we'll do a margin top of 50 pixels. This is all just to make this look somewhat nice. And then we'll style our H2 as well. So the our H2 is that text that said winner is X. We'll set the color to green yellow, just like we have with our other text. Then we'll also set our font size and we made it a little bit bigger than our font at the top. So we made that 3EM in our example. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to fix that padding over here that we have and we're going to set that to margin top and we'll put zero pixels and that looks a little bit better. Lastly, we can go ahead and style our button. Since it's the only button on the screen, I'm just going to use the button selector and I will go ahead and set our background color. And for this, we can just set it to transparent, which means the button is see-through. Then we'll also set the color to green yellow. And for the border, go ahead and also use green yellow. And we'll make that one pixel solid. We'll add some padding to that and pixels all around. And for the font size, we will go ahead and just use 1.5 EM. That makes it a little bit bigger. And there we go. And since I'm zoomed in so much and kind of squished with the screen over here, this 3 EM doesn't look really too good for H2. Let's go ahead and just set that to 2 EM. Save it. And now you can see this looks a little bit better than what we just had.
I'm going to show you a cool CSS trick. You'll notice within our CSS, we are using green, yellow everywhere. And if we want to change that, well, we got to go update each one of those colors. One thing that we can do is within our body, we can go ahead and add the following. We can add a color. Now, normally this would change the text if we didn't set it. Let's say that we set this over here to orange. Now, nothing changes. What we can do within our CSS is everywhere that we're using green, yellow, and we want to use that color that we defined in the body, well, we can put current color. So we'll find everywhere that we put that green, yellow, and replace it with current color. In our H1 over here, we can replace it. In our H2, we can also replace it. And then for our button, we can do the same thing there too. And let's just say we want to use current color for our border and for our color. We'll also change this here and save it. Now, the neat thing is that we can change the color in one shot. Inside of here, we can go back and we can change that to green, yellow. We could make that yellow if we wanted to. You can change the color now in one place instead of having to change it in multiple. I'm gonna go ahead and change that back to green yellow because I thought that looked cool, but a lot of those other colors look pretty cool too. To determine if the game over area is visible on the screen or not, we're gonna go ahead and add two CSS classes. We're going to add one called hidden and it's going to display none. And then we're also going to have one called visible and visible will just do the opposite. So it'll display block. And then within our HTML, we can go to our game over area over here. And by default, when the game starts up, we'll make sure that that is hidden and we're going to set the class to hidden over here. Save it. And now our game over area is hidden. Let's finish cleaning up our HTML over here. So for the strike, I'm going to remove that strike diagonal two. I'm going to leave strike on there. Then we can go ahead and remove these temporary X's over here. I'm going to select the angle bracket and the X and then do command D, command D, command D and command D. It's control D on windows or multiple cursors, delete those. And now we don't have any X's on the screen. In the demo that I showed you at the beginning of the video, we had that hover text as you move your cursor around on the screen. Let's go ahead and add that as well. So we'll be doing that in our index.css over here. And you can do that at the very bottom or anywhere that you feel like doing it. And we're going to add a new CSS class called X hover, and we're going to give it colon hover colon after. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say inside of here. So what we're doing is we're creating a class called X hover and we're saying hover is a pseudo selector. So when our mouse is over it, it'll be activated. And then after is going to place some HTML inside of the element that we place X hover on. So over here, all we have to do is put content and the content that we're going to display is X. I'm going to make that capitalized as well. Then let's do the same thing for the O, just so we can see that working right away and double check that it works. We'll put the O there and we'll put a capital O over here. This is lowercase and lowercase. Go to our HTML and let's just test this. We'll do X hover over here. And then over here, we'll just do O hover in the next file, just so we can test that. Make sure both your files are saved. Come back over here. We see the X and we see the O. And the only other thing we want to do maybe is get that opacity so that it's lighter and we'll set our opacity for both of them to 0.4. I'll copy that and also put that in the O and save it. And then we can come back here and we can see that it's working. Let's go back to our index.html. We're going to remove those. Those will be added through our JavaScript. Now that we have our UI built, we can go ahead and focus on the logic of the game, which will be inside of our JavaScript files. If we go back to our files, we can go to index.js and start to implement that. To make sure that you've wired up your JavaScript correctly, let's do the following. We'll just do a console.log. We're going to say hi inside here. And then in your developer tools, this I get to it, go to more tools, the developer tools. You can also use the shortcut to get to it. Click on the console tab and just double check that it says hi. If it says hi, we're good to go. If it doesn't say hi, go back to your index.html and double check that you have your script tag and that it's pointing to the index.js file. I recommend leaving your console open while we develop. If there are any errors, you'll see them on your console over here and you can go ahead and immediately fix them in your JavaScript. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get to those tiles. We'll just say tiles is equal to document.querySelector all. So we want to get all of them and we're going to look for all the tiles because remember we added that class to every single tile called dot tile. And then once we have our tiles, we can also go ahead and define a few constants. We know that there's a player X and we're just going to set that to a value of X capitalized like that. And we'll do the same thing for our O and we'll just set that to over here. And then we're going to be tracking the turns. So we're going to go ahead and create a let because that variable is going to be changing. So constants never change. 
that's the CONST, and the let's do change. And we're going to say that our starting position will be X. To track the state of our application, where the X's and the O's are on the board, we're going to go ahead and define a constant called board state. And the board state is going to be equal to an array. And that array is going to be equal to the tiles.length. So that means this array over here is going to be nine items because we have nine tiles on our screen. Then the other thing we're going to do for our board state is we're just going to also fill in that array. And we're just going to set all the values to null. To make sure you're in a good state, make sure you click save. See that there are no errors in your console. You can also type board state and see that there are nine items. Next, we can go ahead and just get our elements in our HTML from our JavaScript. So we'll just create a little section over here. I'm just going to put a comment called elements. We'll do a const strike and we'll say strike is equal to document.getElement by ID. And then we're just going to look for strike because there's our strike in our HTML looks like the following. You can see that it has an identifier of strike. So we're going to do the same thing for game over area as well and for the game over text and for play again button. While we're here, I'll go ahead and also set up our sounds that we had. So I'm going to create a folder called sounds and inside sounds, I'm going to drag in the click and game over sound. Now those sounds will be available inside of the project on GitHub that you can download. And since we got those sounds as well, we might as well set up variables for those so we can call those later. And we'll just define them as cons as well. And we'll have game over sound is equal to new audio. And new audio is just going to go inside of the sounds folder and get the game over sound. So just the name of that file. You can see it's game underscore over. So sounds game underscore over dot wave. And then we can do exactly the same thing for our click sound. Get our click and click is simply just called click. If you decided not to get the sounds, you can go ahead and just skip adding these two variables as they don't really have any impact on the game other than adding some fun sound. Let's go ahead and add an event listener to each and every single one of our tiles. The easiest way to do that is we have a list of our tiles and we can loop over them using for each. We'll give it a tile and for each tile, we'll call add event listener. And we're going to be adding the click event. And then the function that we're going to call is called tile click. So this is the function we're going to define below. Let's go ahead and implement that tile click. So we'll define the tile click and the tile click will take in an event. That event will give us more information such as which box was clicked. The first thing that we're going to do inside our tile click is we're going to check if the game over area is being displayed. If it is being displayed, then you're not really allowed to click these boxes. This is really simple. All we need to do is get our game over area, check its class list, and we're going to check if it contains the class visible. If it contains the class visible, that means it's being displayed on the screen. Then we'll go ahead and if it is visible, we'll just return. So that means this function will stop executing over here. If it's not visible, we're going to continue executing our code. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to get a reference to the HTML element that was clicked. The way we do that is we do it from our event and we go event.target. And this will get us access to the HTML element that got clicked. For example, if I click in the second square over here, that's what the tile is going to be representing. Since the tile represents that, we can access information on our tile about which tile number was clicked. Now remember on each tile, we added something called a data-index. Well, data-index is a special attribute that you can add that lets you store extra information on your HTML element. So on our tiles, which are a div element, we're storing extra information, which is the index. Let's take a look at the documentation as well. The documentation goes to explain that we can add this extra information to our HTML elements. It also has an example over here with an article showing that it already has an ID. And by adding the data attributes, we're adding extra information like the columns, the index number, and the parent. Then it also shows us how we can access that information. So over here at the bottom, you can see that in order to access columns, index number, and a parent, we can access it as follows. We get the HTML element of the article, and we say dataset.columns, dataset.index number. Notice the dash over there becomes, uh, gets removed, and the end becomes capital, and then we can also access our parent. So in our example, to access the index over here, all we have to do is say tile.dataset.index. 
and we're accessing our tile number. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do a check. We're going to say if our tile.inner text, so we're just checking the text, and we're going to check if it doesn't already have a value. We're going to say if it's not equal to blank, then that means an X or an O must be inside there. And if an X and an O are already inside there, let's return. By returning, we're exiting the method. So the next thing we can do is we can now go ahead and check whose turn it is. So remember, the game starts with the turn being player X. We're going to go ahead and check what the current turn is. And we're going to say if it's equal to player X, then we're going to do the following. We're going to say tile.inner text is equal to player X. We're going to be setting it to player X since this is player X's turn. And then we're going to go ahead and update our board state. We're going to use our tile number and minus one. So arrays always start at zero. So that means this array is going to go from zero to eight. Now our numbering over here starts at one. So since it starts at one, we have to minus one from it for our array. So we'll go ahead and minus one. And then we're going to say that this is player X's spot on the board. And we'll go ahead and set the, that. And then the next turn, since player X already went, now it's going to be player O's turn. So we'll go ahead and save that. And we can go to our board over here and go ahead and click in any one of the boxes and we should get an X. If we try clicking again, we're going to get nothing because the turn is player O's turn and we haven't handled that yet. We only have two different players, so we only need to do an else over here instead of an else if. And inside the else, it's very similar to the code that we had above, except we're going to change this over here to an O and change this to an O as well. And this over here, it goes back to player X's turn after player O has gone. We can go ahead and give that a try. We'll click in different boxes. You can see it's alternating between X and O. If I try and click in a box that already exists, it doesn't let me click. I can click in another box. We can also go down here into our console and take a look at our board state. You can see it's filling all those values in. I just click in the first one and the last one, and then we take a look at our board state. You see that the first one is X and the last one is O. Optionally, once we set a tile on the screen, we can go ahead and play the click sound. Earlier, I just named it click, but I'm gonna rename it to click sound. And then down here below, right after our if else, We'll go ahead and call click sound dot play. Now, every single time we click in a tile, we're going to get that click sound. Feel free to leave the sound enabled. However, I'm just going to go ahead and disable that. The next piece of functionality that we're going to be implementing is the hover text, which will give you a preview of where you're going to be placing your X or your O. I'm going to be implementing that before the tile click over here. So let's go ahead and we're going to create a function called set hover text. The way that this function is going to work is it's going to work in two steps. One, it's going to remove any hover text that already exists, and then it's going to add the hover text for the current turn. Let's start with that first part. So the first part, we're going to remove all hover text. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to loop over our tiles and we'll do a for each again. And we'll do an arrow function. And then for each one of our tiles, what we're going to do is we're just going to call class list dot remove. And then we'll remove X dash hover. And then we're going to repeat that line below and we'll remove O dot hover. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to define a constant called hover class, and we're going to figure out which class we're going to be using based on the current turn. And for this, we'll use string templates. So I'm going to use a backtick dollar sign. And then what we're going to do is we'll take the current turn and we'll make it to lowercase because remember, we made these capitals. So if we go up above, we'll see that it's a capital over here. So X and O. So the value that gets set here is going to be a capital. We'll just just make it lowercase and we can just use lowercase like that then we'll go ahead and just add dash hover so this will either be o dash hover or x dash hover then we can go ahead and loop over every single tile and go ahead and set that hover but we only want to set that hover if there isn't already text there so if there's no text we only want to set the hover then so inside of here we'll go ahead and we'll just do an if statement and we'll just check the inner text and we'll see if the inner text is equal to empty then we'll go ahead and add that class so tile.classlist.add and we're going to add the hover class that we just defined above 
Now this function over here isn't being called just yet. Actually, it's not called anywhere. So let's go ahead and call it when our application starts up. So now when our application starts up, we can see we can place X. But once we place X, it's not really working quite well. The thing that we need to fix is that every single time we click, a turn changes. So we need to reset the hover text. So we go into our tile click over here. And let's say after we play our sound, we'll do set hover text, all that there. So we call it when the game starts. And then any time that we click in a tile, we click X. And now it's O and you can see that there's no value here. And continue placing. And if we go over ones that have values, it's not trying to put hover text there. It looks like it's working perfectly. The next thing that we're going to focus on is determining the winner. So we're going to be checking the winner anytime a tile has been clicked inside of. So after we've updated the screen and updated the board, we can go ahead and check if there's a winner. So over here, we could call a function called check winner and check winner would be called on every single tile click. There are a few different ways that we use to determine the winner of tic-tac-toe. We could loop over every single row and check if there's three of a kind or every single column and then also check the diagonals to see that all three are the same. We could also prepare a data structure ahead of time to determine the winner. And just a little refresher, the winner is whenever there's three in a row, whether it's a column, a row, or a diagonal. So what we're going to do here is we're going to prepare a data structure, which will describe the winning combination and then also the type of strike through to use. Because remember, we created classes for each and every single row and column determining that line that we draw. So let's take a look at this data structure that we're going to create. Let's go ahead and start implementing the data structure here at the bottom of our file. And we'll call it constant winning combinations. Now this is going to be an array. And inside of this array, we're going to have objects. And each one of these objects are going to describe two things. What is that winning combination? And what is the strike through that it should use? So let's start with the first one. We're going to go row by row. Remember that we named all of these tiles. So this is tile one, tile two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So our first winning combination, if we want to do the rows, would be one, two, and three. So let's go ahead and put down that data structure one, two, and three. And then the strike class that we would use. So we'll create another property on here called strike class is strike row one. So that will strike over here. And we can also look at our index.css. And if we scroll on up, you'll see that it's matching the class name that we have over here. Then we can go ahead and implement the next row, which will be four, five, and six. Over here, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to duplicate that line and then it is four, five, six. And we just change our class name to be row two. And then it's seven, eight, nine for the final row. And we just change our strike row three. Then we can go ahead and implement our columns. And I just added these comments here. So it's a little bit easier to read. So for our columns, they're vertical. So this is going to be one, four, and seven. So one, four, seven. And then for our class name, if you want to make sure that you don't make an error, you can always go ahead and just copy it. So strike column one, go back here, paste it in. And then we just repeat the same thing for the other two columns. So that's going to be two, five, and eight. And then change that to a two, change that to a three. Come back over here and we got three, six, and nine. And then all we have left to do is implement our diagonals. So we'll just add our diagonals there. We'll do the first diagonal and we'll go ahead and copy that name once again, just to make sure there's no typos. We got this strike diagonal one, and then we'll go over here, paste that in. And then for this one, we're going to go this way. So that's one, five, and nine. And then we'll duplicate that over there, change this to a two at the end. Diagonal is going to go this way. So that's going to be three, five, and seven. Now we can go ahead and implement our check winner method. So let's create that function over here. Inside this function, what we're going to do is we're going to loop over all of the winning combinations. We'll be using the of keyword. So we're going to define a variable over here called winning combination. And we're going to do of our winning combinations list. And then what we can do inside here is just for a test, we'll just do a console.log. And we'll type out winning combination there without the S. 
So it's exactly the same word, just remove the S there. Then let's go ahead and run our app. So this is getting invoked on the click over here. So that's the click method above right there, tile click. And what's happening is we're just printing them out. And you can see if we expand each and every single one of these, we're getting the different winning combos. And we have a combo and a strike class for each with different values. We'll go ahead and delete that. Now we can go ahead and extract the combo and the strike class from our winning combination. There are two ways we can do this. We can do it like this, where I declare our cons and extract them like such. Or we can use something called object structuring. Now this will be just on one line and we're going to do strike class and then we're going to say equal to winning combination. Now what this is doing is it's extracting the combo and the strike class from our winning combination, which is an object that looks like this. What's neat about this is it kind of puts it on one line and it makes it a little bit easier to look at. So we'll go ahead and delete that. And if you're interested, this is called object destructuring. I also have done a video on this in the past if you're interested in checking it out. I'll link it above and in the description. There are two things that we're going to be doing in our check winner. One is we're going to check for a winner. And the second thing that we're going to check is if there is a draw. In our check for a winner, we're now going to use our winning combination to get the values from our board. The way we're going to do this is as follows. So we're going to get each value and store it in a variable. So we get tile value one. Now remember our board state is an array. So that means the first value in the array is zero. Over here, we define the first value as being one. When our board one is technically zero in our array. So what we need to do is we need to look at our array. So we'll look at our combo and we'll get that first item. Now in this example over here, let's pretend it's one. Well, that means we need to minus one. This is going to be the first item in our array. And then let's go ahead and do the same thing for tile value two and three. So I'm just going to duplicate those and we'll put two and three there. And then inside our combo list, we're going to be getting the second number and the third number there. And once again, because we are tracking the position within our grid over here and not an array position, which means that we just have to minus one from it so that we get the correct value from our board state array. Now we just want to check that all the values are the same. Technically right now, all the values are the same because they're null. So let's put a little check in over here and we'll say if tile value one does not equal null. And then what we do is we just want to check if tile value one is equal to tile value two. And then also check if tile value one is equal to tile value three. If it is, then it means that you won the game. So we'll go ahead and say tile value one is equal to tile value and there's just a little typo over here and then we'll just check tile value one is equal to tile value three and if all of those values are equal to each other that means there's a winner and if there's a winner that means we have to do the strike through so let's go ahead and do the strike through now if you recall earlier we had got a reference to our strike up above where we got all of our elements so over here is the strike that we got from our screen Go back down to our code and we're going to do class list dot add and we're going to add the strike class that we just extracted above over here from our winning combination. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's go ahead and give that a try. So over here, I'm going to click and we're just going to get an X across the top and it looks like we got an error. So on line 77, it looks like we have a typo. We'll go ahead and fix that. Now let's go give that a try again. So we'll try and get that X over there to pass. And there you go. We have a winner and we have a strike through. Now that we have a winner, we can go ahead and implement our game over screen. So we're going to create a new function over here called game over screen, and we're going to pass in who the winner was. So since all of these matched, that's going to be the winner and we'll pass in tile value one. We'll go ahead and implement our game over screen here below our check winner function. We'll call it game over screen. And the text that we're actually passing in, so we pass in tile value one, but that's technically the winner text. Then what we're going to do inside here is we're going to define a variable called text, which is going to be equal to draw by default. Then what we're going to do is we're going to check the winner text. If the winner text does not equal null, that means that our text is going to be either X or O. We'll say text is equal to, and we'll use a string here with a back tick. We can pass in a template and we'll pass in winner text over here. So this is going to say winner is X or winner is O. 
and we can put an exclamation if we want at the end of that. Now, this isn't going to do anything yet, so we're getting the text. Now we're going to go ahead and manipulate the DOM elements on the screen in order to show this. So we have our game over area, and we're going to look at the class name. And we're going to set the class name, which is going to override all the classes on there. So this means that the hidden class will disappear and it'll be replaced by visible. Then we're going to say our game over text, which is the text we're just playing around with. The inner text is going to be equal to our text over here. And then we're going to play the game over sound. We'll say game over sound dot play and we'll give that a try. Let's get a winner over here. So we'll get X vertically and you heard that game over music and we have that text on the screen that says the winner is x let's go ahead and implement the logic for draw so basically the logic for draw is going to be that every single square is filled in with a value that isn't equal to null so let's go ahead and do that and we'll just say all tiles filled in so we just want to check that all the tiles are filled in and we'll look at our board state and we're going to use an array method called every if everything matches this condition then it will return true so it's going to check that every single tile does not equal equal to null and if that returns true then what we're going to do is we're going to say all tiles filled in if that is true show game over and what we'll do is we'll just do game over screen and if you recall, inside of our game over screen, if the winner text is null, then it stays as draw. The winner text is filled in, then it tells you it's either the winner is either X or O. Let's give draw a test over here. So I'm going to go ahead and get a draw. Make sure I don't win. And there you have it. It's showing the draw text. It played the game over music. However, there is one tiny little bug here in our check winner, and it is incredibly easy to fix. Here is the bug. So right now we are about to win with X. I'm going to put an O there, and now X is going to win and the entire board is filled. It should say the winner is X, but it's going to say it's a draw. So we just need to go ahead and fix this. This is really, really simple. So in our for loop over here, what happened was we found the winner. We probably set the winner. And then we got down to the draw and said, hey, all the tiles are filled in. So uh, let's go ahead and consider this a draw. Easy enough. We don't want to get to this code over here if this code has found a winner. So all we're going to do is put a return over here. This is why we used a for over here instead of a for each. With a for each, if we took a lambda expression in, we couldn't do a return to exit the check winner if something like this happen so sometimes it's good to use a four sometimes it's good to use a four each but in this situation the four was fantastic because we were able to put our return over here let's give this a test over here so we're in the same situation as before i'm going to put an x over here and now it says the winner is x and if we try draw out again let's go ahead and draw is still working as well lastly let's go implement our play again button so for our play again button we'll find our button here on the screen that we defined and we're going to add an event listener over here so we're adding this click event listener and we're going to go ahead and define a function called start new game just go put that at the bottom of the screen here and function start new game Inside of start new game, we're going to do the following. We're going to grab our strike and we're going to clear its class. So we're going to reset its class just back to strike. Whenever we use class name like this, we're clearing everything that was there before and replacing it with whatever we put here. So if we have multiple classes, we would put multiple like this. That means it would have two classes on it, strike and strike row one. But since we only want one, we'll just put strike there. Then for the game over area, we're going to go ahead and hide that game over area. And we're also going to use class name and we'll put hidden. Then for our board state, which we're tracking in that array, we're going to go ahead and just fill it with nulls. And then for each tile, we also need to get rid of all the text that's inside each tile. And we're going to go ahead and just set them to empty. We'll do that for each over there. Get the tile, then tile.inner text and set that to an empty string. Make sure to use one equal, not two. Then we'll also start the turn at player X and we'll also set the hover text so it is correct. If we ended on player uh, O's turn, then we could have the wrong hover text. Let's go ahead and save that. And then we'll go ahead and just get a winner over here. So let's just get our winner. Now let's try that play again button. And there you go, it cleared it out. Let's double check that it works properly. We'll do a diagonal. And there you go, our button is working. 
Congratulations, you've just built Tic-Tac-Toe using nothing but HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share.